Hello, hello, hello! Welcome back to the only YouTube channel on the internet. And if you're new here, what are you doing? Come on inside. What, what are you doing standing out there in the cold and rain? Come inside to where it's nice and warm in my bosom. I'm having a really bad hair day, so I'm wearing a hat. Please don't judge me. Like you would judge me for wearing a hat for, for some reason. I don't know why I said that. All right, it's time to talk about Wano, folks. I am loving this arc so far. The, the start, act one, fantastico. I give it a solid 10 out of 10. Oda talked about how excited he was for this arc like hundreds of chapters ago in one of the SBS question corners. So I've been kind of hyping it up in my own brain because if Oda is excited for something, I'm also excited for it. And so far, Wano ain't letting me down. That shit ain't letting me down at all. It is bussin' bussin' so far. I'm a little upset that that sentence just came out of my mouth, but I meant it. I wholeheartedly meant it. The beginning of this arc has everything that I wanted in a setup. It has personal stakes. It has action. It has reintroduction of characters. It has creative world building. It has a unique entrance. It has unique culture. Everything that I'm looking for in a One Piece arc to start off the story of the arc, it has all of it, man. So far, Oda is going plus ultra on all of the things that we already know that he's good at. He's taking them and he's like, oh, but look at what else I can do. I can do all of the stuff you already know that I'm good at and I can do it better. He's somehow taken the formula that we've gotten used to from him. All of the elements that I just addressed. He's taken all of them and he's elevated them for Wano, which is insane because he's already so fucking good at it. So I guess let's just start with the entrance to Wano. When the Straw Hat crew are arriving and the water starts looking kind of weird and it looks like the Japanese paintings of old. And this is a whole other thing that I could talk about. I love the way that he has brought in all of this imagery and uh, stylistic choices that relate back to uh, Japan and uh, medieval times. That's probably not the right term for it. You know what I'm talking about. But you, he brought a lot of that imagery in and the, the costuming, everything just fits so well, but he's managed to blend it with his personal style so that it matches that old look but also has his own flair to it which I just love I love when he does that in general but I feel like he's doing it very deftly with the Wano arc so far but I got off track so when they're entering they they enter these waves and it's all chaotic which they were warned about beforehand and then they see the fish that are swimming in the clear water and they're following them along and they have to follow them up a waterfall reminded me so much of like the entrance to Skypea I am a sucker for when Oda does that kind of stuff, when it's like difficult to enter an island, when there's some kind of an obstacle that they have to overcome before they can even step foot on the island. I like that kind of shit. For me, it just adds this element of the world being its own living, breathing entity that has its own phenomena that our crew can't just you know, waltz into wherever they are. Like nature is its own thing in one piece. And this is an example of that. There's these fish that can swim up this waterfall. There are these naturally occurring storms that make it difficult to approach this island. Like these are small little things that just make the world feel a lot more alive, I guess. And it just serves, you know, the narrative purpose of built-in conflict that the characters encounter. And actually, in this case, it adds another layer of conflict because the crew is immediately separated as soon as they get on to Wano. And at first, it just shows Luffy as he's waking up on this island and there's these giant animals that are fighting next to him. And even just the design of the animals, I'm going to go back to that point I made earlier, even just the designs of the animals fits that stylistic choice that Oda made to make it look like old Japan. And I really love that introduction is so smooth because it's very subtle the way that the waves look like that and then you get the animals that look like that and then boom you get the spread of Wano country and you see all the buildings and stuff that was immaculately done but anyway Luffy sees these animals fighting and he's soon approached by people who are riding one of the animals and there's a little girl with them and so Luffy's just like and she's not having a good time so Luffy's just like all right gotta beat these guys up and then he beats them up and he meets Otama so far, I think Otama has served an ingenious purpose for the plot. 
One, she introduces us to the hardships of the people of Wano because after Luffy saves her, she says she's going to feed him food and she gives him like a bowl of rice and we quickly find out that that's the only food that she has after her, uh, it's not her father, it's just like this fatherly figure tells Luffy that that's the only food she has and that she's not eaten anything for however long and that she, she can't even drink the water because the water is polluted. So she serves as this narrative device to sort of introduce us to the trials and tribulations that the people of this island are going through. The second purpose that she serves is that we see that she has this power where she can pull from her cheek. I still don't even really know what it is, but she can pull from her cheek and she gets these little balls that she can feed to animals and the animals obey her once they eat it. And this is important because of what we already know about Kaido's army, that they are almost all manufactured by smile fruit and that they become sort of half beasts. And very quickly, we find out that her cheek ball things can also influence those half animal people. So it's immediately introducing us to not just the trials and tribulations of the people of Wano, but also the way that the army has been set up and different ways that they can potentially go about, you know, fighting this army. And thirdly, this is the most important purpose that her character serves so far, and that is introducing the personal stakes that Luffy has in this arc. Because we find out that my man, Big Bro Ace, was on this island like four years ago. R.I.P. King. And while he was there, he made all sorts of promises to this little girl. And he told her that he was going to come back and he was going to find a way to make sure she was never hungry again. And in Luffy, she sees Ace. And this is perfect stakes building for Luffy. Because tell me, tell me anything that Luffy cares about more than his chosen family and food. Name one thing, one thing. I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait. Is there anything? That's right. There's not, there's nothing. And what are the two things that he has personal stake in in this arc? Ace in protecting his legacy and uh, following through on the promises that Ace made and getting people food. The personal stakes could not be higher for Luffy. I think that is some ingenious writing to set up the two things that our main character cares about the most being sort of the pillars behind the motivations of what he's doing in this arc. And I feel like this personal stakes building here with Luffy is just indicative of the overall ingeniousness of the entire setup that is being done. But before I get too deep into my thoughts about all of that, I want to talk about Zoro's re-entrance to the story because it was badass as shit. When we see Zoro, he's about to get executed, or I guess he's about to commit seppuku. They, for some reason, think that he's like a serial killer, I guess, and they find out that he has that cursed sword, and they're like, yeah, he definitely did it, and now you gotta kill yourself. And Zoro, using like the half blade, slices upwards and cuts the entire temple in half and slices that guy to bits. And before he does it, he says, I smell blood, and it says, you're the killer. Okay, Zoro. All right, Zoro. No need to make my dick hard like that, bro. You know, I was sitting there thinking to myself, like, it's been how long since we last saw Zoro? What, what, what like 80 chapters or something? And this is his reintroduction? Bro, I would have busted a nut if I was reading weekly. That is crazy. I love Zoro. I, I, I am a huge simp for him. And I that was such a badass moment. I love those moments when Zoro is just like a cold-blooded badass. They come once in a blue moon. And when they do, fantastico. And on the flip side of that, we get a really sweet reunion between him and Luffy when they spot each other across the desert after, after you see Zoro in the background and you just see this lone figure running up and slicing them and then going, I need booze. And then he turned and you see it's Zoro. And then they just kind of, they see each other in the distance and he's like, Zoro, it's me. And he's like, Luffy, it's you. And then they, Luffy jumps off and like hugs him. Oh, it was such a sweet reunion. Their bromance and dynamic as captain and first man is uh, to die for. I love them so much. Honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, Zoro has a lot of bromances. I'm starting to, 
starting to get invested a little bit in the bromance category here. I'm jumping ahead, but later on, him and Law are kind of, they're kind of teasing each other. Law's kind of getting mad at him. He's kind of getting a little, getting a little feisty with Zoro. I'm not asking in particular for this, but if anybody knew of something in the realm of let's say Zoro and the law fan fiction, I wouldn't be angry if you were to leave a link in the comments, potentially. But I, that's ridiculous. I would never ask for that. But I would never read anything like that. That's, that's for lonely teenage girls. But I wouldn't complain, necessarily. <laughs> Anyway, let's get back on track. Forget I said anything. Another funny bit about their reunion is that Luffy has, he's basically LARPing as a samurai and he has this, uh, this cursed sword that he took from the, the dude that he met, the Otama's like dad or whatever. And Zoro can sense that something's up with it. And he's like, yo, let me check that out. And Luffy's like, no, 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 it's mine. I don't want you to have it. And then he like throws the scabbard at an enemy and Zoro's like, seriously, what are you doing? You don't even use a sword. And he just like punches someone with it. Dude, uh, it's so on brand for Luffy. It was such a, uh, it's such a funny little cute moment between the two of them. Another great thing about their reunion is that it takes about a chapter before they're just wreaking havoc across all of Wano. Because any time that Luffy and Zoro are in a room together or are alone together in any way, shape, or form, destruction is going to ensue. It's just, it's just a matter of how long it takes. And going back to Law, actually, I think it's hilarious that as soon as uh, all of his, his crew is, they see the Straw Hats in the distance and they see that Luffy's there and they go and report to Law. They're like, oh, Straw Hat Luffy's there. <laughs> and Law just turns around. And he's like, what? Stop him. Stop him before he does anything. And he like immediately doesn't, he's not, doesn't show any kind of relief. Doesn't show any kind of like, oh, he's here. He's immediately like, Oh fuck! What is he doing now? Like he doesn't even have to be told that he that Luffy's doing anything yet. That's so funny, and it's just indicative of Law's relationship with the Straw Hat Pirates as a whole. Because ever since he met them, everything they do, he's just like in shock or he's like appalled. He's like, "What are you doing? You guys are crazy!" And this is just a perfect representation of that. It was also cool finally just seeing the rest of the crew again after being gone from them for a while. You know, just seeing Frankie work on a house, seeing. Usopp be a snake oil merchant essentially and then Robin's like this dancer I forget the, the, the term for it or whatever it was just nice to see the crew again before I get too much further into the story real quick, I want to talk about the fact that there's like these factories and that the, the, the island is like this wasteland and that the rich people on the island have sort of consolidated all the eatable food. This to me is one of the most blatant forms of oppression that we've seen in One Piece. It feels like with a lot of the other islands that we've encountered so far, the oppression we've seen is largely just like there's someone with nefarious efforts that are trying to undermine the good people of the island or that are doing something malicious, like, you know, almost like martial law, kind of keeping the people down or doing something that literally keeps the people underground, like in Dressrosa or whatever. This is the first time that there's like an entire ruling class that is just like consolidating literally all the good food and controls every aspect of these people's lives. I don't know if it's intentional, but it seems like there's some commentary there about like environmentalism and stuff, which I always appreciate when it's done well. But going back to the story real quick, Zoro and Luffy steal a bunch of food from the, the rich ruling class as they're coming in to deliver that and they give it away freely to the town. It's not long after that that they find themselves facing against a sumo guy, which <laughs> I did not expect that to happen. It's a pretty minor part of the arc so far, but I thought it was a fun little fight between Luffy and the sumo guy, because you could tell Luffy was just having, he was just goofing around, he was having fun, and I love that when uh, Luffy steps up in the ring or whatever, he, he's like, oh, I'm pretty good at sumo, and then you see like a little card, and it's like, Captain uh, Luffy of the Straw Hat Pirates, undefeated against Usopp, and then I sat there for a couple minutes imagining Luffy and Usopp having a sumo wrestling match on the deck of the Sunny, and it made me smile, so... But really, the big schmeat 
of this first act of Wano comes in the last like four chapters. And God damn, there is some crazy shit that goes down. We have the big reuniting of the Straw Hat crew, except for Zoro who gets lost. Somehow he gets lost. God damn it, I love the bit of Zoro getting lost, but that's not important right now. The reuniting of the Straw Hats happens, and then they, they meet up with Momo and Samurai Guy, who I can never remember his name. Nope, still can't remember his name, but they reunite, and everyone's kind of getting together, and they're trying to figure out what the plan is moving forward. They're, they're explaining what all the factions are, and that they have these samurai who are sort of like secret sleeper agents that have these tattoos on their ankles that are just waiting for the call. There's also another order of samurai that they talk about. God, I'm trying to think of the name. I'm so bad at names right now. It's like the the something scabbards, the 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 the, the, the red scabbards? That's right. right. I'm probably wrong. Wait, no, no. I'm definitely right. No. I can't remember. It's I think it's the red scabbards. <laughs> and there's like nine of them that are like this this group that sort of leads the rebellion, I guess. But that's not the thing that I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the fact that Oda is bringing in fucking time travel. I didn't know we were going to go back to the future in this bitch. What? My jaw dropped like I was a cartoon character. My jaw dropped to the floor when I saw the panel of Kinemon. That's his name. Oh, my God. I just remembered his name. But when Kinemon said, I'm from 20 years ago, we're from 20 years in the past, the way... I, I almost passed out, dude. I, dude, dude. Dude. And we find out that Lord Odin, who I've heard about a few times now, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that I'm going to get like a full backstory for this guy because Oda does not talk about some nebulous character this much and not show me more about them. I don't know if it's going to be him that gets a backstory or his wife, who I'm actually probably more interested in right now because we find out that she has the time time fruit and can jump forward in time. And you know what the implications of that is? She could have been around during the void century. She could have been there. She could have been there in the, the time that I want to know about. She could have been there. And if we can flash back, maybe we'll get some answers. Who knows what she's seen? That's such a crazy thing to bring in. She could be from any point in history. And for some reason, she decided to stop at this point in history. I can't remember exactly what she said, but she said something like, I needed to meet Odin. This needed to be the time for me to stop. But like, why? For what reason? I want answers. I keep saying this in every video, but now this is yet another mystery. And this time it's time travel. And I like time travel. That shit is always interesting. I don't give a damn about paradoxes. But, interesting thing here, Oda kind of set it up so there, there can't be a paradox because there's no back time travel, there's only forward time travel, therefore, if I'm correct, there's no paradoxes. I could be wrong about that. I want to go on the record and say I don't want there to be any kind of time travel paradox stuff happening. I just am really excited at the, at the idea of time travel being introduced into One Piece because it expands the possibilities of what is going on by tenfold. Anyway, I don't really have much to say about this right now because I don't know what the fuck is going on with the time travel shit. It just blew my goddamn mind and it actually explains a lot about Kinemon's behavior when they first meet him when he's so confused by like modern things that are going on. At first, I thought it was because of Wano's closed borders, but now I realize it's because he literally just emerged from 20 years in the past. Of course, everything is confusing him. But to me, the biggest thing about this time travel is the amount of weight, the overwhelming sheer amount of weight that is added to the events of Zoe. Because looking back on that scene when the samurai emerge from the forest and then cat and dog guy, they get down and bow to them and say, we've waited for so long. I thought they meant they'd been waiting for like a month. They'd been waiting for 20 years. That moment, I, I went back and reread it afterwards because I, I just had to, oh, it just, oh, it's so much heavier knowing the implications of what actually happened there. And you can see it. You can see it when you go back and read it. It's like, oh, this isn't the reaction that you would have after like a month of waiting. This is a 20 year reaction here in that, oh, Oda, you beautiful bastard. How did you pull that off, you bitch?
You goddamn bitch. You, you're killing me. My heart can't take this shit. I'm just kidding, Oda. I love you. Please, please don't get mad at me if for some, some reason you're watching my video. <laughs> Honestly, guys, that shit is wild, but I don't want to talk about it too much because I have a feeling I'm probably going to learn a lot more about it. So let's just leave it there. I'm, I'm very happy that this, the events that are going on are going on. And it's shortly after that that Kaido emerges. I don't know why he showed up for some reason, but he's drunk, which is kind of funny. And he's in his dragon form. Unfortunately, I did have the fact that Kaido could be a dragon spoiled for me because I saw like a screenshot or something at some point. It's not crazy, crazy big spoiler, but I, he can be a dragon, which is cool to actually see on page for the first time. And Luffy's immediately pissed off because he hears that Kaido did something to Otama and he goes sicko mode. He goes all out. He launches his biggest attacks on Kaido. And it's crazy because it's like four straight pages of Luffy just beating the shit out of Kaido. And then he's done. He's exhausted. And Kaido just sits up. Not a scratch on him, not even breathing hard. And with one fucking hit, he KOs Luffy. That's insane. I mean, truly, it just shows the enormous skill gap between the two of them that all of Luffy's best attacks didn't even scathe Kaido. And Kaido took a one hit fucking sent him to the Shadow Realm. Insane, bro. And it makes me wonder, like, Luffy's been proclaimed fifth emperor of the sea. He has defeated a lot of people up to this point. And it seems like, in some respects, we're sort of reaching the end game of the narrative. And he would need a pretty, pretty big damn power boost to even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kaido or Big Mom at this point. And I'm wondering, like... What, how, what is going to happen? Like, how is he going to become strong enough to deal with these enemies? Because right now, he doesn't stand a fucking chance against Kaido. And after he loses, he's quickly thrown in jail. Did not expect a jailbreak arc. I'm assuming that's coming. But he gets thrown in jail and he ends up in a cell with Captain Kidd. He's a character that had quite a bit of buildup around the Saba Odi arc, and he sort of has just popped in and out of the story ever since then. And I've always been curious about him. And now it seems like he's probably going to end up being a lot more central to the story moving forward. It's also at this point, I don't know if I'm overthinking things or if I'm looking too deep into it, but someone at the very end says, oh, it's you guys. And they're like strumming like this guitar thing. And at the very beginning of Wano, when we're being introduced to what Wano looks like, we get these tiny little panels of someone strumming like a guitar thing is that meant to be sort of like uh the, the chorus in like a shakespeare play like this outside uh almost uh spectator that sort of sees everything that's going on because it's clearly being set up sort of in like a three-act play structure i don't know if it's meant to be sort of that role from like a greek tragedy or whatever not sure but it could be something. I don't know. Oh, and one more thing before I wrap it up. I totally forgot to talk about Basil Hawkins and his uh, straw man power, which is honestly pretty fucked up. And I don't know why anyone would join his crew considering you just end up as a meat shield for him. But I'm glad we finally found out his power. I thought for sure it was going to have something to do with his tarot cards and those don't have anything to do with his power. So I don't know if they're just kind of just some bullshit that he's pulling off or if they have any real meaning because he does say that you have like an 18% chance of being alive at the end of this month, which is a pretty bold statement to be making. Anyway, I thought that was cool because we haven't seen a lot of the supernovas lately and it's just cool to finally find out what this guy's power is because we've seen him, you know, so many times at this point. I can't think of anything else that I want to talk about right now. I am just loving the start to Wano and I can't wait to continue you. I'm probably going to knock out the next 30 chapters like that, and then I'll be done with Act 2. I looked at all the suggestions you guys sent me uh, with, the, with all the different uh, breaks and stuff. I'm going to see how I feel as I approach them. There's a good chance I'll probably make at least two videos on the second half of, or on the third act of Wano. Might make three, depending on how much I have to talk about. And in other news, if you're still sticking around right now, I set up a Discord server because there was a couple people who wanted to chat with me and I figured this is probably the best way for me to accomplish that. And I would love for anybody to join and just like be able to chat with you guys outside of my videos and the comment section. It would be great to just talk with everyone. And the link is going to be in the description of this video if you want to join in. Everyone is welcome. I would love to talk to any and everybody because you guys are making my experience of reading One Piece all the much more enjoyable. And just to be able to, you know, have direct communication with you guys would be fantastic. And if you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe. Stick around. We would love to have you here.
And until next time, I hope you're all happy and healthy. I hope you're fighting off the winter blues. I know I am. And I will see you guys next time.